you got the note, generated, selling it on a wrap. Where do you sell it? Where do you, where, 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 because we're talking about selling the, the property through a wrap. Where do you, where do you sell the note? Where do you sell the note? Well, you, you can sell the note, but remember when, if you bought the property with almost nothing down and got 20% down and you sold it mm -hmm. on a $200,000 house, you're doing pretty good. Yeah. You probably made more money on the down payment you did on just a flip fee if you just bought it for cash and flipped it. Right. So, so, but you could sell the note. And one of the things that we teach is like how to recapitalize your business strategies. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so, um, the, the biggest investor for private notes right now, the, the loans that we deal in are, believe it or not, the same guy that we're buying houses from. They're burnout landlords. Because after they've owned two rentals, they're not out of cash, they're out of tolerance. Mm -hmm. And so we, we circle back that same pool of people, and now they're the same people that buy notes from us. Genius. Well, I mean... You know, when, you know, I've had note school for 20 years, mm -hmm. right? And so people, there's a pattern of, of your students and they come up and there's a pattern to their stories. So the story has become for years and years, who trains, wh what does note school train? Well, note school woke up and figured out it trained a lot of burnout landlords because they were coming to learn about notes because they didn't have a tolerance for rentals right. or they were just tired of them. They just figured out rentals was not meant to be for them. Well, there's a funny thing about rentals. There's, you know, you're an engineer, right? Mm -hmm. There's the spreadsheet, there's the Excel spreadsheet, and then there's the checking account. Mm -hmm. And what many people have figured out with rentals is the spreadsheet is not talking to your checking account. Spreadsheet's theory. <laughs> Spreadsheet's very theoretical. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like learning from a book and then the real world, real world kicking you in the teeth. And, and so the, the math is very much in favor. You know, it's funny. I just left a, a very advanced event. One mm -hmm. of some of your guys were there, by the way. Yeah. And, uh, and so we got into this conversation about this very thing and then the tax angle. And uh, there was some very advanced guys that you know well, and they were saying, well, why don't I sell our finance right now? And I said, I can't think of a good reason. You know, and we can... We can argue about the real estate market. Obviously, you're in Phoenix. It's crazy on fire and stuff. Um, Especially compared to the rest of the country. I had no idea. I thought the whole country is on fire. Well, Austin, Austin and Phoenix are on a, their own plateau for sure. Yeah. Right. And uh, but but once again, if you can take some money off the table right now, that might not be a bad idea. I'm not right. saying go liquidate everything you've got, but you might take some money off the table. Um, we look at the market going forward, and we think the things that affects the market are primarily supply and demand, hmm. right? So right now we have a tremendous shortage of listings, about half of the listings that the market needs. So there's about a million houses listed and about two million houses needed, right? right? So let me ask you some questions. Where is the inventory of houses that aren't currently on the market that might be forced to be put on the market? Well, the idea is the forbearance, and that, that, that is the, the prevailing theory, is yep. we're going to have a bunch of inventory come from forbearance. Yeah, so forbearance really isn't as big a factor as people think it is. We have just I've a, made the same argument, so yeah. We, we have a, just under a tick under 4 million loans that are currently not paying, mm -hmm. okay? 1.2 million of those loans are in forbearance. The rest of them are just not paying. Mm -hmm. so, so a third, call it, of the, the non-paying loans are in a legal agreement where they don't have to pay. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to get modified. Right. I believe 50% I believe of them will get modified and 50% of them won't be modified, okay, because they won't qualify. Mm -hmm. Now, but here's the bigger number. Now we've got, you know, just under 2 million or just under 3 million loans, right? Mm -hmm. That are delinquent, not in forbearance, not in any kind of legal agreement. And that we're going to be looking down the gun barrel in six months. Uh, they're going to have to do something because the notice of default's coming. So based off the data you're, you're reviewing, 
there are a whole bunch of people that are not paying their mortgage. That's correct. But they're not in a foreclosure process. That is 100% correct. Because the banks were not allowed to foreclose when the hands were tied. It's pin up inventory. Mm -hmm. And here's the other thing. Uh, National Home Build Association came out with uh, some statistics, call it 60 days ago. They're saying that there's 800,000 houses under construction. So what we have to do is look over the hill and look at what could affect inventory, Mm -hmm. right? And so there's some reasons to think that shifting to, you know, using creative finance strategies and reselling the house, you know, and, and taking some of our rentals off the table, there's a reason to think that that could be a possibility. Now, once again, the market and the situation and people's financial wherewithal and all that stuff has, has a factor. But um, there, there's some shadow inventory on the horizon. Yeah. That was a term, of course, that you know that they, they used after 2008. Yeah, they used that a lot. And it turns out it was a little bit overblown yeah. at that time. So I want to take a step back here, right? Because we we're talking about how you've done 50,000 deals, transactions. And it's an unfathomable number, right? I mean, for some people, if they can do like a deal a month, they're pretty happy. So you want to share some of your life lessons we're going to talk about creative some more in a bit. You yeah. want to share some life lessons, how you went from a 20-year-old co-calling realtors. <laughs> I can't even imagine what it was like back then. There was no dialer. There was no yellow letter system, right? So what were some of the biggest life lessons you learned from a 20-year-old co-calling realtors to today to help you get to a point where you've done 50,000 transactions? Well, I, I became, I, I, I really was in the training business long before I had note school. Because what I woke up and figured out was I can buy one note from one person and I can scale that to a degree, but I can never really scale that. I'd never, I would have never done 50,000 notes, just one note from one person. Mm -hmm. So how I did it was, is I, Homevestors became my springboard where I learned to teach a company that could create hundreds of notes, Mm -hmm. how to create, how to create notes then I became their exit strategy. And then I did that with land developers. And started, I, so I, I basically showed them how to become a bank, and then I became the exit for their bank. So you were telling them, hey, here's how you can create some inventory that I will buy. That's correct. What happens is, is real estate investors wake up, and you've heard this many times, right? They make a seller finance note, and then they show up with somebody like us that's a note buyer. Mm-hmm. And then we discount the loan more than they think is fair. Well, the reason we discount the loan is they've done, they've made mistakes in structuring the loan and underwriting the loan and papering the loan. And they've made it not really to meet, you know, an industry standard. Some mistakes that were easily avoidable had they gone through no They school. just didn't know the rules. Yeah. So, and I think it's interesting. So I, uh, I've shared uh, this on the podcast before. I was actually supposed to buy... I was really close to pulling the trigger on buying a Homevestor franchise, right? Uh, at that time, there was, I think, Clint Ship, uh, Mike, I can't remember his, his last name, and then I would have been number three. And this was back in 2011, 2012, right? Because I was mm-hmm. buying houses at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted to buy it, but I had this issue where I was already buying houses, and they're like, you get a piece of every, we get a piece of every single one. I was like, how about I just pay you a piece of every single one that comes from you guys, and I'll keep doing my thing. And they said no. But what was interesting there's two things that were interesting to me when I was reading the franchise disclosure. First was that at that time, Homevestors was owned by Subway, the restaurant. Mm-hmm. That was crazy to me. But the second thing was that they would fund all my deals. Mm-hmm. And I think you have part to do with this. If I could get the seller to sign a contract, at 65% minus repairs. Yeah. Was that your buy box that you had created? Yeah, so them? what I originally did, now you got to remember, I did this for Homevestors in like 1991 through like 2000. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I had a long history with home investors. I haven't done some things with them in years. I'm friendly with them, but we... But I imagine part of your things uh, is still the, in there. But the original underwriting box that we did, even for their hard money lending piece, I was deeply involved in. And um, because once again, we, we sort of knew... We, we were trying to help them not get in trouble, mm-hmm. right? And so we were trying to come up with things that, you know, you don't let 
you don't let a guy have 20 hard money loans out because then, then he's got too many construction projects and he doesn't manage any of them well. Mm -hmm. You know the routine. Yeah. So those were the kind of um, uh, fail safes that we tried to put into the underwriting. So, yep, I did do that. Uh, hadn't thought about that in a day or two, but I did. I wasn't <laughs> deeply involved in that. Yeah. Okay. So, first, great lesson. And I think there's a huge lesson. Help people make a product that you will buy. Teach them everything, empower them everything they need to know yep. so they can buy your product or so they can sell, sell their product to you. It's, so you. it's a, it's freemium education. Yeah. You're giving something of a, of a premium value for free so that you can then grease the wheels mm -hmm. so that then they can do business with you. Incredible. Brilliant.